The next presentation is uh, from uh, Lee Orr from Central Michigan University. It's uh, genesis and maintenance of a long track EF5 tornado embedded within a simulated supercell. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Rob Wilhelmson, Lou Wicker, Bruce Lee, and Kathy Finley. So this is a talk about a simulation I've been looking at um, for a little while. And uh, you're all probably familiar with the uh, May 24th, 2011 storm, um, at least several storms. Uh, one, of the, one of the tornadoes was a long track EF5, and we are simulating a storm uh, that's in this basic environment. This is tornado B2. This is the one that we think is most uh, cl closest to the, to the tornado that forms in the storm that we uh, are simulating. We're using CM1 as well, version 16, with the same Morrison uh, microphysics as was the previous talk. We used a one-hour ruck forecast uh, off the right flank of, of the storm that produced B2 to initialize the model. We're using 30-meter isotropic resolution, free slip, um, using w 4 to get the storm going. And this is run on Blue Waters, a supercomputer with 20,000 processing cores. Some of the software you'll see that I've used to visualize this storm include Visit at Lawrence Livermore Vapor at NCAR and a bunch of glue that, to put it all together. So lots of cape, lots of shear. Um, pretty, pretty clear this is going to be a significant event. And this is our sounding and our, and our hodograph. So let's take a look at the storm from afar. This is a volume rendered uh, image of the storm from uh, about a while uh, far away. 120 kilometers by 120 kilometers by 20 kilometers is our domain. The storm is parked right in the center where the isotropic grid is. We go isotropic up to 10 kilometers, and it stretches above that. Uh, very gratifying. A lot of the features you see in the storm look quite realistic, including a tornado, a wall cloud, a tail cloud, and much of the things you see in the field. This is a track of the actual tornado. This is vol surface velocities over time. So the tornado starts out rapidly, uh, it starts to accel uh, get faster, widen a bit. Then there's this surge of air. I'm going to talk about this a bit. This north northward nor northerly surge, southward flow, enters the 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 basically the the mesocyclone at low levels and really starts to spin up that storm. It's got 130 100 130 meter per second winds the surface. There's also an anticyclonic vortex that comes in and out of, out of frame here and there that you'll see in these animations. This is pressure deficit, so you're seeing 100 to 150 millibar pressure drops at, in the center of the tornado. Uh, eventually, it just gets really wide, about a kilometer wide. Uh, an anticyclonic vortex comes around and sort of uh, messes things up, but I only follow it out to here. Uh, here's a time series of the maximum winds at the surface. This is 130 meter per second mark. This is a very, very strong storm. Um, I'm going to focus on T equals 64.14 here for some of my stills. But uh, this, EF, this is the EF5 cutoff right there. It's very strong. So here's uh, just a snapshot of reflect, simulated reflectivity. Here's the tornado right here. And you can see this. I'm going to be focusing a lot on the southward flowing, uh, I guess you'd call it a vorticity jet or something. Uh, here's potential temperature perturbation. Here's the RFD, which is very tightly coupled to the storm. Much of the RFD air here is actually quite buoyant. But I'm also going to be focusing on the forward flank and what's going on over here. We have a diffuse boundary, but then we have these little secondary boundaries and uh, rather cool air in the, in the for, uh, forward flank of the storm. This is a movie of cloud and rain showing the evolution of the, of the storm during tornado genesis. This is the anticyclonic guy that kind of comes and goes. This is what I'd call a tail cloud. Uh, lots of detail here. There's the tornado forming. There's the wall cloud. We start to see uh, things that you often see in the field in the, for, in the rear flank with lots of uh, you know, in the rain, uh, you see a nice little uh, curtain of rain that forms around the, uh, around the wall cloud. You see some of those tentacles flying around that people have been talking about lately. Uh, very realistic looking simulation, a lot going on. This tornado is on the ground for uh, an hour and 40 minutes, and then I just stopped the model. Um, it is weakening at this point and occluding as well. But, um, but it's very exciting. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any other work that has shown this kind of detail and this kind of temporal and spatial uh, resolution. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating simulation. Um, a lot of the things you see in the simulation, uh, I looking at storm chaser footage and talking to some folks who chase storms, uh, looks you know fairly reasonable. Uh, we do have an issue with rain not centrifuging out of the tornado, just so you know. That's something we have to work on. And this goes on and on. I'll be showing some of this at video night much slower. Um, so uh, that's sort of what it looks like. Uh, Sort of photorealistic. Now we're going to focus on vorticity magnitude. This is the volume rendered vorticity magnitude, the forward flank of the storm, the rear flank of the storm. And I'm going to be focusing a lot on what's going on right here. This is during tornado genesis. The actual tornado is going to form right about here. This train of vorticity, this is baroclinically generated horizontal vorticity that's being swept, sucked, I guess, into the updraft. It's being tilted and uh, clearly tilted. And it is 
sort of feeding the tornado cycle in a loft. This is not going to be uh, interacting with the tornado directly. So here is the same sequence looking into the updraft. Um, and so here this is a cyclonic vortex. These are the sort of cyclonic. This is that sort of ribbon of vorticity. This is an anti-cyclonic one that kind of comes and goes. It's interesting that it's leaning in a different direction. There's probably a good reason for that. Um, but anyway, so this is during Genesis. So this, this ribbon of vorticity is being uh, sucked into the updraft and being tilted into the vertical. And it's likely that this feature here is probably playing a role in the longevity and the strength of the tornado. But we have a lot more um, uh, research to do on this. Here's another view of the same uh, tornado Genesis. So here is the updraft, 55 meter per second updraft ice surface. It gets down to about, you know, a, a couple hundred meters above the ground. You have that kind of wind. That vorticity is just getting sucked into the updraft. Lots of small little vortex mergers occurring here, and there's a lot of little vortices that form along the forward flank that kind of edge southward into the main circulation. There's also a lot of RFD surges you're going to see when the storm really gets going. So here is, uh, we've already seen this. This is the anticyclonic circulation and the cyclonic. I just labeled them. This is focusing on slightly larger values of vorticity, so you're going to see uh, pretty much pure circular flow in a lot of cases. So this is going to be our tornado. It's not a tornado yet. You don't see it yet. At some point, we have tornado strength winds. There we have the, the lowering of the, of the condensation funnel. And watch, you'll see a lot of these little vortex mergers occurring right about here at the surface. Um, and that jet that I'll be focusing more on lately is, doesn't really show up very well here, but there's a lot going on. It's very complex. Um, over here in the, fore, in the rear flank where we like to focus our attention, there's a lot of these uh, surges, and a lot of them are positively buoyant. So we have positively buoyant air at the surface, air with you know uh, a few degrees uh, delta, delta theta from the environment that's being swept into the updraft, and that's also probably playing a role in the strength. We see vortex breakdown occurring aloft. This is gratifying. I know that tornado uh, studies on smaller scales have shown this feature, and um, a lot of interesting vor vor vortex uh, stuff going on. So, so anyway, here is a, a view of the forward flank. These, are, these little guys here, are, are they a figment of my imagination or have they been viewed in the field at all? Well, there's a paper by Snyder et al. from a couple of years ago that shows the same kind of features occurring in radar. So I think that we can say that something like this has been seen before. These guys are trailing southward into the, into the main circulation. This is a tornado. This is a one kilometer by one kilometer. This is the 130 meter per second uh, contour here. 100 meter per second. So we have basically EF5 winds everywhere, or it's kind of uh, right around here. Um, and you know, this is actually storm relative, so I haven't uh, added the translation. So we'll look at Genesis again, looking at isosurfaces. So we're going to focus on uh, these are the values we're looking at: forward flank, rear flank. So uh, focus on, and there's also pressure perturbation here, which is I'm going to talk about a bit. But you can see the cold pool. We're looking at it from sort of the rear flank perspective, uh, back back a little bit. But anywhere you see red at the surface is positively buoyant air, because this is the buoyancy. Uh, we're just calculating buoyancy of the surface. So right now we're sort of in the phase where the tornado is forming, but hasn't the, the condensation funnel hasn't occurred. You see uh, an increase in the amount of RFD activity, warm surges. This is just a view from afar, just to give you a perspective of the storm. Uh, updrafts and all the compensating downward motion. Um, and as I zoom in here, you'll notice that bam, 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 look at all that warm, yummy RFD air. It's feeding the updraft, and, and you also have this stream of vorticity coming in on the forward flank that I'm going to focus on next. Uh, actually, next I'm going to show you pressure perturbation, 15 HPA. So this is the tornado. This thing extends upward to 16 kilometers. You can see a signature of a tornado in the vorticity field. There's interesting things going on here. Here's that little anticyclonic guy. Here's a tornado. The pulsing, I think, is gravity waves bouncing around, but I really want to focus on this little lobe of vorticity, or I'm sorry, of, of pressure perturbation. This is, this is like a 20 to 25 uh, millibar pressure drop not associated with a tornado. So this is associated with what's going on over here. And this, uh, this st streamer of bare clinically generated horizontal vorticity along the forward flank that's being sucked into the storm, I believe, is, is associated with that, uh, that lobe of vorticity, a lobe of pressure perturbation, sorry. Uh, we'll let it go a little longer. Um, it's sort of, uh, you'll see as this sort of progresses, uh, it, it, the isosurface sort of shrinks in because uh, there's some destructive things going on with anticyclonic vortices right here. You see the thing just kind of goes um, and, and that's where it starts to get a little weaker, only a moderate EF5 at this point. <laughs> so here's a view from afar, again, looking down the forward flank boundary. I'm going to show you potential temperature perturbation values to show that it's diffuse, but there's also these secondary boundaries. There's a lot of baroclinic vorticity that can be generated and tilted. And this is like the money shot. I mean, here's the... Here's that beautiful uh, inflow. Here's these little guys that are sort of merging with the tornado. Here's the tornado. Here's vortex breakdown. And here is that anticyclonic guy. 
So it's very exciting simulation. There's a lot of things going on that I think uh, deserve further research. Here's just to give you your perspective. We're back here, reflectivity. I wanted to show at least one contour plot. So here's the updraft, 10, 20, 30 meter per second, solid black. Uh, the dashed black is, is downdraft. Here's that, this, this ribbon of vorticity that's coming in is actually negatively buoyant because it's, it's originating from the forward flank behind the gust front. Um, zooming in a little bit. So this, for instance, is a 20 millibar pressure drop at 500 meters above the ground, not associated with the tornado, which is here. I stopped drawing contours here. It would just be a blue blob, right, because we got a 150 meter pressure, uh, millibar pressure drop here. Um, and some of the positively buoyant air is actually in downdrafts because of what's going on in the RFD. So now we're going to focus on um, looking at maintenance. And this is the feature here. This is that vorticity ribbon, which, which appears to be something like the leading edge of the forward flank gust front, very clinically generated, simply being sucked into the updraft. But notice the tornado is over here. This is feeding the tornado cycle in a loft and is providing all this vorticity. It's being tilted into the vertical. And then here's the tornado. And all this, this vorticity mess over here is mostly due to what's going on in the RFD. It's very, very turbulent flow. However, some parcels and some vortices are entering the tornado along the storm's forward flank as well. <clears throat> I'm going to drop some trajectories soon. You can see what's going on. So this is just a wall of trajectories across this boundary. Probably too many trajectories. And don't blink because they'll move too fast. You won't see where they're going. Um, but anyway, as you'd suspect, some of them are going to end up in the tornado. But this is the one, this guy here, this, this region I'm going to focus on a little bit, uh, is feeding the tornado cycle in a loft and I think providing some of that vorticity that's helping to make this thing all go. Um, but yes, uh, definitely uh, lots of the air from behind the gust front in the forward flank and the rear flank is getting into the tornado. This is just, this is, this is exciting. This is just that little blob there. I'm just dropping trajectories every two seconds. It looks, you know, this is actually turning and tilting. It's, it's classic, you know, uh, tilting of vorticity. And there's a relationship between what's going on with these parcels and these, low, these little guys here, the little uh, like mesocyclones that end up actually merging with the tornado. Uh, is it a here horizontal shearing instability? Probably. Is it a vortex sheet that's rolling up? Probably. There's aspects to these things in this simulation. But there's other things going on as well. And this one here really shows it, right? Because look at this air. If, uh, if this isn't streamlined vorticity, I don't know what is. Um, you know, it's just going right along the stream, you know, and it's rotating. You can see the rotation. You know, you can see it going up and over. But notice the tornado is actually about a kilometer away from all this air. So this is feeding it aloft. And this is just, I'm going to slide back and forth and show you some steady street, state stream tubes during this maintenance phase. So the air outside there is, is pretty much entering the out, outer periphery of the updraft. But as you get further into the forward flank, you can see a lot of these parcels are entering the tornado at very low levels. And I haven't done a whole lot of trajectory analysis yet, but a lot of the uh, parcels that enter the tornado at low levels are originating in the forward flank and, and sort of in the region between the forward and rear flanks in the cold air. This is negatively buoyant air. I'm going to drop some parcels now in the RFD. So nice uh, capture of the interface between the updraft and downdraft. Uh, a lot of these parcels find their way over to the tornado. They take, they take their time a little bit, and they end up entering more of the updraft that supports the tornado more than right getting into the tornado air. Um, and here's that ribbon of vorticity that I think plays a, an important role in what's going on. Here's a view of a different time, but showing a nice secondary RFD surge. Boom, there it goes. And wow, you know, look at those parcels. I mean, that is really surging the, the storm forward, and those parcels are getting into the updraft. I mean, it's, there's no, no doubt about that. I did decide to do a few backward integrated parcels to see where the air is coming from that enters the tornado at very low levels. Um, the bulk of it seems to be originating from out here. This is just one or I've only done a couple of these. Um, I'll talk about this in just a second. Some of the air is definitely entering the tornado from uh, the warm side, but this is a two-celled structure. We're resolving the tornado. These are parcels just being dropped at like 1.5 kilometers above the ground. They're getting into the into the sinking air in the center of a tornado, and they're recirculating upward just like the two-celled model tells us it should. So this is very gratifying. Um, I think we're really capturing uh, something pretty good here. Um, and uh, here you go. Woo, here we go. And then you know you'll see that guy kind of go up there. I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. So anyway, that's my last video. I'll, I'll sort of close up and, and conclude some things. But uh, while my conclusion slide rise, ro rolls, I just want to say that um, I would love to bounce some ideas off of the folks in this room, experts on this stuff. I think there's some interesting things going on. There's a lot of different avenues we could take. There's definitely something going on with the positive RFD surges, the, turn the, uh, the, the parade of vortices, and the very clinically induced ribbon of vorticity that's getting sucked into the updraft. Um, and uh, this is just a very, uh, you know, preliminary conclusion. We've got lots to do. 
Um, yes, we don't have friction turned on. Don't throw anything at me, but we're working on looking at the implications of this. In this talk, because I know it's not hard to, hard to see in the back of the room, you can go click to ORF, that's my name, 5.com slash SLS14, and you can watch the whole talk on YouTube. ORF5.com slash SLS14. And have at it, and I'd love to talk to you about this. Thank you. All right, uh, we have time for maybe one question, and then we'll defer others to the end of the session. Paul, in the back. Yeah, so for that's really a pretty cool video. Um, <laughs> but, so, but. <laughs> no, for, so for decades, uh, we were told by people who modeled tornadoes that it was really important to have a uh, no-slip lower boundary condition to disrupt cyclostrophic balance to drive a radial inflow of angular momentum. You've shown here that that's not, that's not right. You don't need it. Any comment on that? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, th that's true. Now, we did a lot of simulations, and we tried friction. We've done all sorts of things. This is the one simulation that, that really worked. Um, why? That, that's the that's a big question, and and we have to look at the role of friction. I've turned friction on, but the first grid point is uh, is uh, 15 meters above the ground. You start slowing. The winds that are entering that tornado are right very low levels. When you turn friction on, it just messes everything up. We need to increase our vertical resolution down to say a, a couple. I'll talk to Dave Llewellyn about this, but like maybe five meters near the ground, and then maybe you can turn friction on and not destroy this thing. But to answer the larger question you're asking, I don't know. Those guys are pretty smart. All right, so we, we have some work to do, and that is a good question. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Yep.